which is about, uh, not about uh, cities, it's about specific neighborhoods, uh, which I call arrival cities. A lot of planners and geographers and people like that said to me, oh, why did you go and invent a new word for something that we already have a whole bunch of words for, like neighborhood of initial settlement. And, 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 and the reason why is because you need to understand the way immigration and integration work on urban neighborhoods in a dynamic way. Um, we tend to look at these neighborhoods uh, as collections of people or collections of income categories who come from a specific place. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is to get us to understand the dynamics of this. How people who are arriving for the first time <clears throat> make use of the urban neighborhood as a tool for uh, their social mobility, for the future of their families, for the mutual support of, of new immigration. Um, <coughs> and behind this, we have to understand how immigration works. Uh, I think people often falsely believe that countries immigrate to other countries, that, that, that Italy, and <coughs> Italy and Portugal immigrate to Canada, or that, uh, that uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh immigrate to Britain and so on. But what happens everywhere almost around the world in almost every situation is that specific sub-regions and clusters of villages in one country immigrate to specific urban neighborhoods in another country. You can map the streets of southern Los Angeles to specific clusters of villages in Guatemala and Honduras. You can, you can map the streets of East London to particular parts of Sillet, a, a fully rural district in northern Bangladesh. And from my experience living in the 80s and 90s in Toronto, you can map specific uh, neighborhoods in, for example, the Davenport Riding where I live, to uh, certain villages in Abruzzo in Italy uh, and uh, villages in Greece and, and, uh, and uh, villages in the Azores. And what happens in the neighborhoods of cities when people land? Well, I hardly, I, if, if you live in Toronto, it's easier to, to show this is how. We know the basic history of how these sort of neighborhoods formed, of how what I call arrival cities were created. <coughs> this, is, excuse me, this is Kensington Market in the 1950s, which I think in most people's minds is the model of this type of neighborhood. Various waves of immigrants, Eastern European Jews, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, now Central Americans and so on, have moved into the housing here and used it for specific purposes. What happened during this, this classic period uh, of post-World War II immigration was that people who were too poor to live what would be considered a normal life in the city sought out places where the property costs and living costs were low enough that you could uh, you could settle in the city uh, and get a foothold in business, in housing, in education, and so on. During the post-World War II years, cities like Toronto had large stocks of housing in their central cores that we, we would say nowadays were underpriced, that were affordable to, uh, to new arrivals. And what happens when people arrive? Uh, they find a place to live, often eight people to a room. Uh, it's, it's usually in individuals who come first. They form connections with other people from the same place. They loan each other money. They start small businesses. Uh, they, they buy housing. They build up what you call social capital, and they build up actual capital. That capital is used to send their, their children into the educational system, to engage themselves with the political system, to a large part of that capital is sent back to the originating village uh, to finance its development and also its future immigration. In other words, they form, they use these neighborhoods to form <coughs> networks of mutual support. Uh, and this happened in Toronto and other Western cities uh, in the post-war decade very successfully because people were able to, to do the things that new immigrants want to do. 
they were able to rent and then purchase housing at great rates. Uh, they were able to form small businesses, uh, often within their housing, as we see here. Uh, because first of all, there were no restrictions, or there were few restrictions on new arrivals being able to enter the housing market uh, or to form a legal small business. Oh, there were not restrictive zoning laws that prevented them. Well, actually, there were restrictive zoning laws, but they were largely ignored. <laughs> and uh, uh, they, people were able to do things like what you see here, which is to form uh, retail, uh, restaurants, even small, small industrial <coughs> operations within their housing areas. And this, this network of commerce and activity was also beneficial because these inner urban districts were closely linked to the established urban economy. So that if you opened a small shop or restaurant, you were likely to get foot traffic and vehicle traffic from people who were not from the arrival city. So you were able to link your local economy into the established consumer markets and established supply chains uh, of the city. You were also able to get jobs. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing in this book that this is some sort of uh, laissez-faire utopia where every new immigrant is a uh, small business person who goes into success. I would say that even in the most successful arrival city neighborhoods in the world, maybe one family out of 20 goes into some form of small business. But that one family out of 20 creates what economists call network effects, which sends benefits across the neighborhood in terms of employment, and in terms of example, in terms of uh, people are able to do the economic things they want using the resources they have, then, uh, then they will tend to succeed. Uh, if they are able to link themselves into the educational system, into the economy, if they're able to obtain full legal citizenship fairly quickly, then, then the, the arrival city neighborhoods, the networks of people and mutual support tend to produce mutually beneficial effects and raise people out of their income poverty also, incidentally, provide, provide large income support for the villages of, of the places where they come from. But sometimes these neighborhoods fail. They, they fall into poverty, they fall into uh, violence, they fall into various social troubles. Um, and and people, ident people believe this is a, a, a natural factor of the people who are living there. They say, well, this is them, they moved in, they brought this. Even, even if people from the same countries and backgrounds who've moved to other cities experience great economic and integration success. Uh, in most cases, you can, you can point to this. You can, you can show that, that people who came from the same villages to one city become sort of a, a, a gradual success story. People who move to another city become the, the social problem. This is, a, this is a neighborhood in, in downtown Antwerp that I've studied at some length, which I, th I, I saw as another Kensington market as a, as, or a White Castle Spitalfield as, as a successful integration story, which is seen by people there as a failure because there's gang crime, there's trouble, there's extremism, there's forms of poverty and deprivation that we've seen before. And when you look at what's happened, one rule of the arrival city is that the thing that makes the arrival city fail, if it does, or, or become trouble, is often the thing that made it desirable as an arrival city. Why do people move into neighborhoods when they come from a rural village on the other side of the world? It's because for some reason the housing costs are much lower than, than in other places. What has made those housing costs lower than other places is usually the thing that will create problems. In other words, the arrival city is the bottom rung on the ladder. It often functions very well as the bottom rung for getting established, forming these networks. But the thing that makes it cheap often is the thing that, that eliminates the second and third rungs on the ladder, that, that, that cuts out the next steps of upward social mobility. Why is that? Sometimes you can point to the physical layout of the neighborhood. You know, in, in South America, in, 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 in Rio or, or Caracas, it's because the neighborhood's up and down the, the size of a cliff, and there's no chance of getting anyone to go to your, to your business. Uh, in some cases, it's for uh, policy reasons, though. Um, here in, in European cities like this, uh, it's 
It's often because there is no pathway to full legal citizenship. The people who arrive are stuck being semi-citizens for a long time. They're unable to legally start small businesses. They're unable to legally put their children in post-secondary education. And they're unable to legally buy housing. So you do not get the investment in the neighborhood that can cause it to grow and succeed. You see the same things in the United States where, where you, have, you have millions of people who arrive from Central America who are deeply engaged in the economy, have been there for many generations, but because of the citizenship restrictions in the United States, are unable to buy their housing, invest in, in the neighborhood, and so on. And this causes an economy of decline to happen. Um, I mean, in this, in this particular neighborhood in Antwerp I studied, people simply said we are unable to do the things that new immigrants want to do. We get stuck. So I show people find ways to succeed and thrive, but they're ways that are illegal or in the gray market economy, which is a legal pathway to closing them. That's not so much of a problem in Toronto. Um, but what, what's happened now is that we have a new form of arrival city. In those post-war decades, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and most of the 80s, the arrival city was that classic Kensington Market, Little Italy model uh, of downtown, uh, tightly high-density housing with, with mixed opportunities for usage, uh, good road access to consumer markets, and, and so on. Since then, that's, as, as I don't think I need to tell anyone here, there's been an inversion of, of of this in Toronto, and now new immigrants almost entirely arrive in the various forms of suburbs, in the, in the inner ring suburbs uh, uh, and the inner parts of the outer ring suburbs, in, in, in high-rise suburbs. This is not, not unique to Toronto. Um, this is happening in, in almost every US city, in, in Atlanta and Washington, DC, and so on, that almost all the new immigration is to the suburbs. And this includes not just middle class immigrants who come in, but most of the poor uh, immigrants also end up in the suburbs. It's certainly true in Europe, um, in most places, although it's a bit of a different dynamic because in Europe, the, the suburbs uh, tend to be public housing uh, projects run by state or quasi-state agencies. In North America, it tends to be private sector uh, housing. And how do you fix this? Uh, the problem with the arrival city when it enters the suburb is that you, the new immigrant can't always do the, the new immigrant things. Uh, you can't open a shop or, or a restaurant or a small uh, manufacturing enterprise within your housing unit in that classic way and expect customers to be able to, to, be able to come there. You can't, uh, you often can't buy and sell housing in the same way. Uh, you, you often don't have the density of people and customers for your businesses. And if you have a job, often the difficulty is that it's a very long transit distance away. I mean, when I studied the, the French, what they call Banu riots of 2005, one of the big problems people said why their, why their kids had fallen into violence and anger uh, was that most of the people who lived in these neighborhoods had a two-hour, sometimes three-hour transit ride to some other district for their crummy job sitting on the floor, and then another two hours back. And their children were left with the, the empty cement spaces between apartment buildings as their main form of, of childcare during the day. And no wonder they fell into gangs and all this. Uh, I think we've seen this in, in, in North American cities as well, that long transit distances create a, a lack of Economic opportunities, a lack of, of connections of small businesses to markets, but they also they also create a disconnect between families themselves and their own members through this deprivation. So often the, the the thing that can fix a failed arrival city is a transportation thing. Even on a very low level, here we see Sao Paulo, Brazil, which had famously the fraud slum, which was able to turn a lot of them around into hopeful, upwardly mobile neighborhoods by introducing bus routes that connected to high speed trains. Not a, not a terrifically expensive form of transportation, but it can really change these neighborhoods. If someone opens a famous ice cream shop way out in the outskirts, then people will take the easy bus ride to get there and will buy stuff there. If you have a job now, it takes half an hour to get there rather than two and a half hours. Let me conclude by taking a look at why 
new suburb in Arrival City that uh, I used in the book Arrival City that I think characterizes some of the ways that, that the suburbanized Arrival City can fail and some of the ways it can change. This is Slotterbahn, which is on the outskirts of Amsterdam. It was built in the 1950s um, as an act of high-minded planning uh, under the belief that it, after the bombs during the years of the war, that people would not want to live in those in those ugly, dirty houses around the canals of central Amsterdam, but they'd want to live in, in a nice, planned neighborhood with the buildings far apart and curvy streets and all that stuff. And it looks very pretty uh, from the train. It looks like a it looks like a Lego design or something like that. Um, and it, it had all the characteristics of 1950s mid-rise design. It had large green spaces between buildings. It had very, very strict zoning separating residential from retail from industrial. And it had a big green belt separating it from the city. <coughs> this made it look very nice. It also, unfortunately, it never was really home to people moving out from the downtown core. It became, like so many of these places, home to people moving into the city with the central city as their destination, who are coming from Morocco, Turkey, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, etc., and for whom this type of neighborhood was the absolute worst possible place to be settling initially. Uh, you could not, you could not form any kind of small business uh, within the building structures or between them. If you did, you wouldn't get any customers because there's this huge green belt and there's very little places to drive or, or parking. The density, the population density is so low that very little commercial activity could start, and that the, the spaces between buildings became, became very scary and violent, and things plummeted. This became the neighborhood that, that produced the young man who uh, shot uh, the filmmaker, the established filmmaker, Theo Van Gogh to death, and caused a political crisis that lasted years in the Netherlands. Uh, and it's almost symbolized by the fact that that uh, within these buildings, you can see the clusters of satellite dishes indicating that it was much easier for the residents of, the, of these neighborhoods to connect themselves to their country of origin by a satellite television than it was to connect themselves to the city they lived in, which was a long trek away from their housing. Uh, and it, this caused isolation, social deprivation, a lack of economic opportunity, there wasn't housing you could buy. There, there, there was no path. Again, it was the bottom rung on the ladder, and there were no visible second or third steps up for a lot of the people who lived in this otherwise nice neighborhood. Why I'm pointing this out is because it was, this neighborhood was subject to some intervention, partly because of the way this type of housing is owned in the Netherlands, it's through housing cooperatives that have some power to borrow money and, and do things that, that exist sort of somewhere between the public and private sector. And they did some things that people in Toronto will, will recognize, uh, but they were very interesting. They recognized that their neighborhood was an arrival city and that it, that it served this function for immigrants, and, and they recognized why it was failing. And they, some of these housing cooperatives tore down these buildings and got rid of this structure with the curvy streets and space and did this with it. Um, high density, <coughs> eight to 11 story building, no space between them, straight, straight streets with lots of car activity. Um, nice little parks and areas behind it. Their model was Lower Sedona Avenue, uh, and uh, as well as places like the Lower East Side and uh, Brick Lane, like Chapel Hillfield in London. And indeed, it looks to us like Lower Sedona Avenue, and it's specifically designed to create that effect in the inner, in the inner suburbs, um, under the belief that by changing the, the form of, of, uh, of building and street, you can change the form of immigrant life within it. Um, it was created with mixed use in mind. The bottom two floors could be commercial, uh, retail, even light industrial, uh, and with a mixture of housing that could be owned and housing that could be uh, 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 rented. It was a mix of, in other words, it was, it was the classic mixed income. They, they did a thing that we'll all recognize from Regent Park, which is, the, which is by tripling the number of people who live in any uh, square meter of this area, they they recognized that they could could profit from this. So there's some of the value capture stuff that was done in Toronto, where where you use the rising value of property by selling some of it to middle class people, uh, which which as condominiums, which finances 
the improvement of the development and also creates a beneficial social mix. In other words, they encourage uh, artists and computer designers and so on to move from central Amsterdam into this high-rise area. This is, a lot, this is a lot like what's being done with some of the new zoning rules in Toronto, allowing apartment blocks in the inner suburbs to densify down the bottom, uh, but maybe a little further along the pathway and maybe more specifically designed with, with, with this specific problem of, of the arrival city in mind. It does, it does not create a utopian situation in the end, but it's been done before. We know, that we know, it, we know it can work because in Amsterdam, it was done 30 years ago with another neighborhood that, that fell into trouble Thank you. 